Well, welcome to our worship this Sunday, which is live via Zoom and will be recorded for upload to YouTube and also air will be prepared so it can be heard on the website through the audio. Got a, a title of anticipating today. Hopefully that will make itself clear as I go through. I'll also mention a bit about them. Um, Fair Trade, as it's a, a Sunday in Fair Trade fortnight. Please join in in the words where it's uh, in yellow and bold. So some words to begin our worship. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So we're going to sing of that love as we join together in hallelujah, your love is amazing. is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. that's growing deep inside of me every time i see you all your goodness shines through i can feel this god song rising up in me continue in prayer. Generous God, as we come to worship you, we rejoice in your love, which brought us to birth, which enfolds us now, and from which we can never be separated. We give thanks for your never-ending love, love which you freely offer to us day by day. Amen. Andrea is now going to read our gospel reading. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. 
What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Thank you. For those who are uh, on the phone, I'm just I'm just uh, projecting an image of some spring buds, uh, using that as a sort of a background to the thoughts of anticipation, the anti anticipation of the spring and the flowers to come. With having to be aware of keeping a social distance when we're out exercising, it's necessary to look ahead to see what's happening We've got three sort of categories this morning of things which we need to look out for. If you look ahead and see a bus stop shelter or no one and no one is sitting or standing in it, you know that as you walk, you can just carry on without any problem. But if someone is in it, is in it and we'll consider them to be non-moving, you might choose to go behind the shelter or if there's not space and it's safe to step into the road to keep your distance. Or if you're approaching a car parked more, more or less across the whole pavement, it might be necessary to go into the road. Not quite right really, is it? Car on pavement, pedestrian in the street. But then there may be visible moving objects that you have to be aware of. If someone's coming to you on the pavement and it's not wide enough for both of you, you may decide to cross over the road. Or you may wait and stand in a driveway to let the other people pass. However, having done either of these things, sometimes you may find that the person turns off your road or decides to cross the road themselves and you need not have had to move at all. In other words, you've moved too early. And then sometimes there might be unseen moving objects. Someone might just appear almost as it were out of nowhere on your pavement and you have to adjust rapidly. That could be to do with a hedge or a fence obscuring your vision of what's around the corner. I know when I'm out running, there are a few places where I run wide of a corner where I can't see around it, just in case someone's coming in the opposite direction. So sometimes we don't know exactly what's going to come along which might surprise us. And in those cases, we may have to try and anticipate what's going to happen in order to make the right decision about what to do next. COVID-19 and our lockdowns have created a situation where we've been able to reevaluate some of the things that are important to us. And that could be to do with different areas of our lives, our homes, our work, our leisure, our faith. And people have begun to speculate about what the future will be like when our freedoms are restored, when we have a new normal. Will there be more flexible working? with more people working from home as a general rule? Will there be a retained sense of an improved feeling of community where we continue to build on our relationships with our neighbours and seek to look after those who are vulnerable amongst them? Will there still be people offering to volunteer to meet specific needs? Will there be a greater commitment to tackling the climate crisis with the recognition that it's a global issue, just like the pandemic is. And we might think about what the churches, ourselves among them, and other faith communities have learned during these last 11 months. And looking forward, can we anticipate what our churches might need to be like and what they might need to provide in the future? And could that be somewhat different from before? 
Are there in some cases some objects that it's not worth taking on? Some churches have decided to close because of the pandemic. Some because they didn't have the capacity to deal with all the requirements placed upon them. Others because they lost key members due to the coronavirus and that was the last straw for them. Other churches have responded more creatively to the pandemic, developing online worship, utilising video conferencing and doing other things too. We might ask, well, will some of those people who've got used to not going to church, who prefer an online approach, just not return? Will there still be a concern for the vulnerable like there's been? Will that continue? Obviously, with the vaccine rollout, there's been concern to give people vaccination who are in the greatest risk groups first. And throughout the pandemic, we've had people shielding and the elderly being encouraged to stay in and those with underlying health conditions too. But those people have been supported in different ways. And some other things have got, gone on, things like food banks and other uh, situations where people are in extreme need or alternatively have mental health issues and need support. Will that concern for the most vulnerable people within our communities continue? We might ask, well, where has God been in all this? Is he seeking to lead us in particular directions and not others? Might there yet be something else around the corner which we've not yet seen? which might cause us to head in a different direction. Well, you might wonder what on earth this has to do with our gospel reading for today. Well, my thinking has been that some of those first disciples of Jesus who followed him did so with the expectation that he would overthrow the Roman rule and usher in a new prosperous era for the Jews. And then others might have followed him because they warmed to his teaching and maybe, maybe saw themselves becoming something of a religious community. And they were excited by that. But perhaps they did not anticipate this departure that Jesus seemed to make in a radically different way. When he begins to speak about suffering and death and rising back to life. A different pathway altogether. Perhaps something they didn't see coming. And talk of them taking up a cross and losing their lives for Jesus' sake may not have excited them much either. I suppose the question for us in our mission as a church is if we do need to do differently things that we've done, if, if, we, do, if we do need to do things differently from what we have done before as we emerge from lockdown, maybe radically different in some cases. How much are we ready for that challenge? Because it's a bit more involved than simply keeping your social distance. I'm going to hand over to Pam now, who's going to lead our Lenten liturgy. Isolation. He was a man of sorrows, familiar with grief. Put on our pain, he carries our suffering. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray, keep awake. Three times they slept while he moved away from them and prayed in anguish, alone, distressed and agitated. Abba, Father, remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Then came the hour of his betrayal. Jesus separated from your disciples, cut off from those you hoped would support you. You gave way to grief and anguish. 
and accepted the weight of suffering with no one to share the load. Comfort those who weep today, those separated from loved ones, those who are fearful and lonely, those isolated in their homes or hospital or in care, those confronting devastating decisions and situations. Draw near to them in your love and show us all that we are never alone. Amen. Some of you were at the Fair Trade quiz yesterday evening, and I wanted just to pick up a few thoughts about Fair Trade following on from that, as we're on this Sunday within Fair Trade fortnight. Those are two statistics for you. The average income of many cocoa farmers is currently 74p per day, which is less than half of what is required to achieve a living income. And 21 people from Cote d'Ivoire for the same carbon footprint as one person in the United Kingdom. Smallholder farmers manage over 80% of the world's 500 million farms and rely on them for their livelihoods. And yet, obviously, their income is poor. Yeah, just thinking about that statistic that I've given you. And they love live in vulnerable locations, which are especially prone to climate related disasters. And they are amongst those who are least responsible for the climate breakdown. Persistent poverty in these farming communities means that they've got an inability to cover basic needs, needs for food, for medicine, for their children's education. And they have no ability really to respond to environmental shocks without help. Because as they can't cover their basic needs easily, then there's no extra to try and do something in order uh, to limit the damage. And then there's further environmental degradation that results from poverty. Because farmers are forced to farm in unsustainable ways just to make enough money to survive. Climate change is already meaning that we have more volatile, less predictable seasons, floods and droughts, high temperatures, more plant diseases, loss of fertile land, crop destruction and lack of food. And that leads me on to some other statistics because some of our favorite foods are being subject to climate change. And if we look forward to the year 2050, we're told that as much as 50% of the global surface area currently used for coffee farming may no longer be suitable due to the changing climate. And also by 2050, many cocoa growing regions in Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire, which produce over half of the world's cocoa will become too hot to grow the crop, threatening chocolate production. And for me being a coffee lover and a chocolate lover, those are not warming statistics. But we know, don't we, that fair trade helps to improve the livelihoods of the poor farmers throughout the world by bringing them together into cooperatives and working groups so that they can begin to negotiate their position within the supply chain and gain a foothold in challenging global markets to try and make sure they receive a fair amount of money for their work. Fair trade also helps to protect the minimum price that they get for their crops when the market fails. And they get extra money from fair trade premiums, which they can then use as they decide on urgent social projects or to strengthen their business or in these days also in order to try and tackle some of the problems of climate, climate change in order to try and mitigate the circumstances. 
But we know that fair trade can't solve all these climate problems on its own. We need to help. And a couple of things that we can do are the following. We can buy fair trade products to support the right for farmers to be paid fairly for their work, meaning that they have the chance to fight the challenges of climate, the climate emergency right now. Something that we possibly do already, but we can always look to see if we can do more. And we can also sign the Climate Coalition's Climate Declaration and let our local MP and our council know about our commitment to that. And that in particular may help as we move towards the meeting later in the year, uh, the COP meeting, uh, when these particular concerns will be addressed. You could also visit the Fair Trade Foundation website and take part in a festival and learn lots more about fair trade if you'd like to do so. But as we think about the vulnerable within the pandemic and how we've sought to respond, we think about the vulnerable globally, those in poverty in particular, and how we might respond to their needs as well. We continue in prayer. After the words in your love, the response is hear our prayers. Living God, we pray for our church here in Cheadle Hume, that you will guide us as we seek to respond to your spirit, leading us out of our lockdown and into the next phase of your mission, both locally and globally. And we pray for all the staff and pupils at our local schools as they prepare for reopening fully on March the 8th. In your love. Hear our prayers. We pray for cocoa growers in Ghana and the Ivory Coast and coffee farmers in Guatemala, Honduras and Peru as they struggle to eke out a living. And we pray for the work of the Fair Trade Foundation, seeking a fair wage for food producers in the developing world and enabling them to have the means to take action against the climate crisis now. In your love. Hear our prayers. We pray for situations which concern us and people we know in particular need. We pray for all those working within the NHS and for the continuing progress of the vaccination programme, both home both at home and abroad. We pray for Shamin and her family and for the family of Sue in their bereavements. And we pray for St Anne's Catholic Church, part of our local Churches Together group. In your love, hear our prayers. We draw our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Please use whichever version you prefer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing again as we recognise our dependence upon God for all things. I need thee 
every hour. like thine can be so I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come to Final blessing. May we know the faithfulness of God in our lives. May we live with the assurance we are children of God and know ourselves to be loved. May we find ourselves faithful, even amidst temptation. And the blessing of God, the three in one, reside with us always. Amen. Next week, the Reverend Jill Newton will be leading the church anniversary service uh, through Zoom and uh, questions have been assimilated or been assimilated so that uh, at the end of the service, rather than going into breakout rooms, uh, there'll be a, a plenary session, as it were, throughout, so that you can all listen in uh, to those questions and to Jill's responses. <laughs>